Hey everybody, you're watching the Mike Nelson Show. I want to thank everybody who's already subscribed to the channel. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to subscribe right now. Today I got a very special guest. I got Joanne Shaw Taylor. How are you doing today, Joanne? I'm good, love. Doing good. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. All right. So when did your musical journey begin? Uh, when did you start playing music? Um, I started playing classical guitar around the age of eight. Um, but really it began before that. My dad played guitar and my older brother, uh, my mom was a dancer. So there was a lot of music in the house, a lot of blues, blues rock, British invasion sort of stuff, a lot of Motown and soul on my mom's side. So, um, was, yeah, just from a, from a very musical household. And was guitar your first instrument? It was, yeah. I was always obsessed with it since I saw my dad bought one home for him and my brother. Um, it was, yeah, that was, that was when the love affair started when I was about six, I think. Now, I read in your bio that Dave Stewart or Eurythmics discovered you. Can, you. can you give me a backstory behind that? Yeah, I started um, I started gigging when I was about 13 or 14. And um, a couple of years later, I was about 15, 16, about to leave school. And uh, unfortunately, my mom had had breast cancer. And um, as had one of the wives from a local band, a big reggae band called GB40. And um, they were doing a charity event uh, in aid of it so I went and performed and um, a friend of Dave's was there and passed on a little demo CD I'd done and he, he phoned the house the next night and offered me a record deal and we all got the train down to London and met Dave and it was all lovely and bizarre <laughs> but awesome yeah you're talking of course a legend in Dave's story with Eurythmics were you a fan of the band before meeting Dave to be honest, which his wife always found this amusing, Anushka, um, I had no idea who he was. <laughs> I mean, I was born in 85 and kind of miss Eurythmics. And, you know, I I was exposed to a lot of music, but hadn't kind of gotten into that. So, uh, yeah, my mom and dad were were very nervous and I just didn't really get what was happening, to be honest, which was probably a blessing in disguise, you know. So how did you eventually become a solo artist? Did you ever think about starting a band instead? Not really, actually. I think it was always in my mind that I'd be a solo artist. I think just because of the early influences being predominantly blues guitarists and, you know, blues guitarists always fronted their own band, you know, whether it's B.B. King or Steve Ray Vaughan or, um, you know, there were a few exceptions to that rule. But no, it was always always going to be a solo artist, I think. Too much of an ego to, to <laughs> work in a band, probably. Now, you came up in the early 2000s. How was the blues scene in the UK during that time? You know, it's pretty strong, actually. I was very lucky in the area I grew up in. Uh, I'm from an area called the Black Country, and they had, like, how I would describe, like, a proper juke joint, kind of, your feet to stick to the floor because there's so much spilled beer, kind of, you know, hole-in-the-wall kind of music venue. And I saw everyone there from, it was a lot of young kind of blues rock bands like The Hoax and Angel Lister and Ian Parker, and then, you know, a lot of uh, travelling, touring American artists like Luther Allison or John Hammond Jr., so um, it was a good education, you know, there was still back then live music to go see, um, which was great because I didn't have the internet. So, you know. Was it hard getting that first record deal? No, I mean, I've always said, I think because I was such a novelty, which I always thought was because of my age. Um, and I was always desperate to lose the teenage guitar sensation thing and then I turned 20 and suddenly I was female guitar player and you know that hadn't occurred to me that I was always going to be a novelty and um you know I've always said I think doors opened a lot easier because of the female thing and being so young but it was a lot harder to keep those doors open you know I think um my favorite quote is whatever a woman does she has to do twice as well as a man to be thought half as good and I think that kind of rang true so it was it wasn't too hard to get the deal but it was a long battle in, in being taken seriously, I suppose. Now, talk to me about your latest record, Nobody's Fool. This was recorded at Sunset Sound. How was that? It was awesome. It was the first time I'd recorded in L.A., which I chose, um, you know, the last two albums I'd done in Nashville and Detroit, and I just fancied something a bit more exotic. Um, and Joe and Josh are based in L.A. anyway, as were the band. So made sense. We pitched up there for about a week. Um, and yeah, it was a wonderful time. It was, it was really, really fun making this album. Now you had some cool guests on the album, including Joe Bonamassa. Talk to me about the guests. Did you get everybody you wanted to, to, to have on this album? You know, it was all kind of organic. I mean, obviously Joe was in the studio anyway, because he produced it. Um, and he guests on a song called Won't Be Fooled Again. And that was just, I mean, again, organic. It was, 
it was kind of an 80s pop song and I was struggling a little bit with the solo because I mean a song that is very much a song song if that makes sense I feel like you've got to justify there being a guitar solo on there because if it doesn't really need one you know you need to be quite clever with the guitar part um so I'd got like a little idea and then I just thought well Joe's so much more dynamic than I am and has such a different personality in his playing and tone it'd be kind of fun to do it as a duet so um he thankfully stepped in on that and then of course there was Dave Stewart and Carmen which uh just worked out fabulously now was this album written during COVID no I did the blues album which was a blues covers album in COVID I really struggled to write in COVID because there was well, firstly, I was making the most of being off the road, um, you know, and kind of semi-retirement because I hadn't stopped touring since I was like 13. Um, and, you know, usually if you took a year and a half off the road, it would drastically, you know, damage your career. But everybody else was off the road as well. So it was I trying to make the most of it. And then the other side of things was that there was just nothing to write about. I wasn't doing anything but staying home and washing my groceries and, you know, watching Downton Abbey. So it wasn't. Didn't make for the most inspiring music. Now you're currently on tour right now. Uh, how's the tour been going? It's been going great. We've been hitting a lot of markets I've never played before. So that's always really exciting. You know, as a as a tourist and as a performing artist, it's nice to, to meet new fans and see new places. So yeah, it's going really well. We got, um, where are we tonight? We're in Houston and then we have a day off tomorrow. So it's uh, it's been nice to get out of Michigan in, in March for a start. <laughs> Now, you're going to be playing uh, this Sunday in L.A. at the Orpheum Theater. Um, tell me about that. Of course, it's a legendary venue. Um, tell me about playing it in L.A. Yeah, I've never been there, actually. Oh, wow. I've been hearing it's a great nice deal place. about it. Yeah, I've done a few interviews for it, and everyone's saying it's one to look forward to. Um, and I think I've actually only played L.A. twice. I did the Whiskey Go-Go with Glenn Hughes, and then I did something else. So it's um, I've been to L.A. a great deal, but it's only like the third time I've played there. So I'm... I'm really looking forward to getting back out there because it's got such a, you know, awesome musical heritage, Los Angeles. So it's always a, you know, bucket list kind of gig. What's the best part about playing live in general? Oh, man. I mean, it's always been, I've always said it's like free therapy. You know, there's so much you go through in life. And I realize how lucky I am to be able to scream into a microphone and play obnoxiously loud guitar and like jump up and down. And that's my kind of way of dealing with stuff but I think particularly since COVID it, it really is lovely to see people back out and and bombs on seats and just you know the idea that people are going to spend their hard-earned money on, on coming out and spending their time with me and, and getting to know me as a singer and a songwriter and a, as a woman and a guitar player and whatever else it's just uh it's lovely to have that sort of connection I think with people you know. Any advice for young guitar players out there? Um, one don't be an idiot there are so many egos in this music industry um and you know no one's out here saving lives we're not nurses looking after kids with cancer you know this is not a tough gig um so check yourself at the door you know be humble um i always say there's been many times i've gotten support slots because between me and the other person up for it i'm the nicer person that they want to be hanging around with all day um so you know be professional and just perseverance. I mean, it's a you know, it's taken me twenty years to to get to where I am, and it's been more downs than ups. So, uh, you know, if you really want to do it, just persevere. Really. Now, where can people find your music, and where are you most active on social media? Um, I tend to post most on Instagram. I find it like a friendlier format. You know, um, I leave the arguments to Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> people tend to go to argue. I found. Uh, so yeah, Instagram, but it's on com and iTunes and Amazon and all those companies, you know. <laughs> all right. I want to thank you, Joanne, for coming on the show today. It was great talking to you. You too, love. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for watching, everybody.